My name is David Gold. I'm a chronic cancer researcher at UCLA. One patient, John Moore, was referred to me, and my diagnosis for his hairy cell leukemia was to remove his spleen. After I removed the spleen, I had more follow up to LA for many follow ups. Moore became suspicious about why I kept having him come, so I offered to play for his plane ticket and hotel so he would keep coming. I sent Moore a consent form saying that he would give UCLA all rights to products developed using his blood and bone marrow samples I collected during the follow up. The first time he consented, but the second two times he didn't, and I started to get annoyed, insisting that he sign the form. He eventually sent the form to a lawyer, but luckily for me, the case was dismissed in court. I devoted more than seven years to the development and marketing of a cell line called Mo, and I eventually filed for a patent on the Mo cells and several extremely valuable proteins produced by the cells. I entered into an agreement with a biotech company that gave me stock and financing worth $3.5 million to commercially develop and scientifically investigate the Mo cell line. The market value of the Mo cells was about $3 billion. In 1984, Moe sued me and used LA's reception in using his body without his consent. He claimed property rights over its tissues and sued me for stealing them. The case was dismissed, but scientists were panicking. What would we do without people like Moore's cells? Moore then appealed, and the court ruled a patient must have the ultimate power to control what happened to his or her cells. I appealed in one, and court backed doctors' rights to use the patient's cells. When tissues are removed from your body, all ownership claims you had vanished. Now the product of my ingenuity and inventiveness, since Moore had technically abandoned himself, I was free to use them. My name is Ted Slavin, and I was a born hemophilia. With this disease came my treatment, including infusions of blood clotting factors from donor blood. At the time, no one realized that I was being exposed to diseases through the unscreened blood. I developed hepatitis B through transfusions of blood. Upon discovering this, my doctor said, despite my illness, I was potentially in luck. You see, despite my odd jobs here and there, I was struggling financially. With my cells, I could sell my tissue for profit, and I was ready to donate. It wasn't all for fame or money. I did it also for those who cope with the disease. As well as selling my tissue to doctors around the world, I offered unlimited use to the Dr. Barry Blumberg, the Nobel Prize of Medicine nominee, who identified the hepatitis B virus. In doing so, Dr. Blumberg was able to discover my treatment and vaccines for hepatitis B. Many people view the selling of my tissues as immoral. However, I am satisfied with the knowledge that I donated to a cause that saved millions of lives. In today's society, I believe I was rightly donating my blood and to advance sciences and better the world. My name is Barry Blumberg, and I'm a dedicated virologist. After studying medicine at Columbia University, I continued on my path as a medical professional. In my work, I've identified the hepatitis B virus, and I was determined to find a treatment. With years of research, countless experiments, I was aided by assistance in donating patients. With the tissue donations of Ted Slavin, I was able to develop a vaccine for hepatitis B. I'm honored to say I am a co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. There are speculations and discussion that buying human tissue for experimenting is not morally right. With an eager man willing to help my research, I believe using my resources to find a vaccine is perfectly moral and I am proud of my accomplishments. We will now begin our debate. Over the past year, the chemistry honors class has read the biography The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. We will now be debating some of the bioethics issues presented in the book. We now call for the opening statements from panel two. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anne John. They are my group members. And we think the heroin herself are, are studying for science, but not for some doctors to make money for themselves. No matter whose cells are, we need to protect them and uh, protect the people who use them to make benefits for themselves. And our group has really strong points to support this idea. Thanks. Thank you, panel three. Panel one, your opening statement. 
The United States Constitution explicitly guarantees the protection of individuals' personal property. Nothing is more personal or deserving of more protection than the right to one's body. The removal and storage of a person's cells, tissues without their explicit consent or consent of the family is crime in and of itself. But in the case of Mrs. Henrietta Lacks, the crime is furthered in severity by subsequent testing of, reproduction of, storing of, and eventually selling and profiting from those cells. All of these actions were committed without the informed consent of Henrietta. Henrietta's family was not made aware of the situation until long after they had lost the opportunity to claim their inalienable rights. Even after her cells had multiplied innumerably and were worth billions of dollars, Henrietta's family saw not a penny. The exploitation of this family is completely unethical. A second offense against the family concerning the use of Henrietta's cells without her consent or knowledge is the clear violation of the trust a patient places in their doctor. Doctors are highly educated and operate in ways mysterious to the naive observer. Henrietta trusted her doctors to care for her and make her healthy. They abused that trust by stealing her cells and giving them to researchers without her permission. The doctors and researchers involved in this story of Henrietta Lacks were clearly behaving in a manner disgraceful to their profession. The opposition may try to sway you with wondrous stories of medical advancements, pleading that their actions were for the good of humanity, through and through. But believe me when I say, the same scientific results may have been reached had doctors and researchers explained the situation to Henrietta and allowed her and her family to make the final call. And the truth is that this did not occur. Henrietta and many others have been exploited by medical research which used their cells without their knowledge. The trust which they place in medical professionals is compromised and the rights to, to that most essential aspect of them, their bodies, is abused. That is the undeniable and unethical truth. Thank you. Thank you, Panel 1. We'd now like to call the rebuttal <coughs> from, on the opening statement from Panel 2. Well, Julia said that if we had simply asked Henrietta to use her cells, we could have reached the same results, but the truth is, is that if Henrietta had said no, then all of the advancements that were made in science because of Henrietta's cells would never have happened. Anyone else like to make a point for penalty? And the things, the ones who are uh, really making the cells useful are the scientists, not the family, or the person who gives the cells. It's not necessary for the person or the family to know exactly the cells are doing. And as long as they know that the cells are helping someone, it's enough. And it's after they know that her cells are doing a lot of great things and making a lot of money, they think back and argue about the unfairness. If her cells didn't, uh, didn't survive at the beginning, they would not care about what the doctors did on her. Thank you, Penelty. Any closing remarks? We will now have the rebuttal from panel one on the opening statement of panel two. Okay, um, we have searched many statistics and we found that 90% of a survey, a people surveyed said they would want to be told the truth if they were diagnosed with cancer or if um, doctors wanted to remove something for their body for scientific research. So 90% a chance that Henrietta would have said yes for her family. Any other remarks in the opening statement for on panel two? Okay. At this time, we will begin to have a we will open the floor to open debate on back and forth for both teams. Uh, please raise your hand when you have something to confer with your team, and a call in one at a time, switching back and forth between each panel. So, panel two, you may begin. Is there anyone who has? No. Okay. So, Delegate Erin said that. Um, African Americans would probably agree to consent to give her cells to the scientists. But if you think about it, back in the 1950s when you have the Jim Crow laws, you have African Americans distrusting the white society, hating the white society, being oppressed by the white society. Do you think that they who believe in witch doctors would want to give a part of themselves to the scientists to use? I don't think so. Panel one. All right. Well, um, as Emily said, Amer African Americans under the Jim Crow laws would probably not agree to this. Um, however, we would not know this unless uh, they were asked. Um, also, Henrietta was confined to the black part of the hospital. Uh, because of the Jim Crow laws, she could not go into the white part of the hospital, and therefore she did not have the same rights 
and that is not fair. She should have had the same ch chance to say, I don't want my cells to be taken. Um, and because she was restricted both by her, the color of her skin and the economics of her, um, and the economics of um, her own situation in life, uh, she went into the hospital with very little money, very little chance of surviving, um, and she had, and because of these Jim Crow laws, she was restricted to this one part of the hospital that did not have the best. Uh, the best that any patient, black or white, deserves. Thank you, panel one. Panel two. Okay. Um, as you said, um, about 90% of people would want to know if their cells were being used or if they could be used for medical research. But originally, like the doctors of Henrietta, when they took her cells away, they did not know how revolutionary they were going to be. And when you ask people, can we use your cells? you don't automatically think that your cells are going to be revolutionary or that they could change the world someday. So I don't think that at this point many people would offer their cells. But if we don't ask, then we could have revolutionary um, um, discoveries like that of Henrietta. Thank you, panel two. Panel one. Um, panel one would like to point out that it has to be explained to patients. If patients don't know what is happening to them, then they don't know what to agree to or to disagree to. Um, there, was a, there was another case um, besides Henrietta's, um, John Moore, and his cells were being used without his permission um, for scientific research. He actually appealed in, um, to the court because he knew he found out um, this before he passed away. So it just shows that Henrietta wasn't the only victim, and hospitals everywhere need to start asking these questions if they want their cells or if they don't want their cells to be used for research. Thank you, panel one. Panel two. Um, as you said in the John Moore, that that's no case. That judge made the case uh, when the tissues are removed from the patient. Um, they leave the tissues in the doctor's office or the lab. They abandon their, t their um, tissues as waste, and uh, anyone can take their garbage and sell them. So some, uh, since the person has abandoned the cells, they are no longer a product of the patients. Also, more cells cannot be produced on their own. They further, pro they are further production of the um, of the scientists so the um, they are transferred it into the invention of the scientists thank you panel two panel one 